it is so good to see you today. We're Amen. thankful that you've come out, come out to worship the God of heaven. Amen. You obviously recognize that you were created and that this life on earth is not forever. And it means a lot to us that you're thinking ahead, that you're putting your priorities in line. All we want to do is go to heaven and take as many people with us as possible. Amen. So we're so delighted to have you this morning. We do want to announce our ladies' Bible study next Saturday morning, 10 a.m. here at the church building. If you're one of the sisters, we hope that you'll make plans to come to that. Invite others to come. It's a good time for the sisters to bond with one another. And then I have a very special announcement. Some of you know that during the last 20 years of my ministry, I've done a lot of writing. I've written a lot of books and workbooks. Here are a few covers. But about two years ago, I decided to put down the pen and stop writing. There were a couple of reasons for that, but I thought, you know what? I'm going to step back from this work. But over the last two years, a lot of people have been calling and asking for books. People have encouraged me to start writing more. And so I've been thinking about it. Well, more recently, several members here said, you know, I think that's something we ought to think about. And so I'm happy to announce that we're going to start a book writing ministry in this church. We're going to call it On Point Press. I'm going to write, but there are other talented people who are knowledgeable and capable. Uh, they're going to be asked to write. Lydia Clay has written a few kids' books. We're going to ask her if she'll write some kids' books, maybe some kids' coloring books. I'm really excited about this. Amen. The idea is we'll produce our own books and we'll make them available at the Welcome Center free of charge. Amen. And then if we write enough books, I'm envisioning a whole room kind of like a bookstore with aisles or shelves and everything's free. Books that teach God's Word, books that are maybe short and simple to read. Can you imagine? Yes. I'm very excited about this. Amen. We're going to call it On Point Press. Even some of the books I've previously written are going to be relaunched under this new name. I'm excited to see where God takes this. So be praying for it. And once we get established in our new building, hopefully that's something that we'll do uh, really quickly. Amen. Let's pray and we'll get started. Father in heaven, almighty God, we bow before you so thankful for all that you are and all that you do. You are the God of heaven and earth, the creator and sustainer of life, the giver of every good and perfect gift. Father, we pray that our service will be a sweet-smelling sacrifice acceptable to you. We pray that you'll be with the preacher and with every hearer. Forgive us of our shortcomings. Help us to have open and sincere hearts. We thank you most of all for your Son and our Savior Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have all been programmed to be performers. Grades in school are based on performance. Badges in scouts are based on performance. Positions in sports are based on performance. Paychecks at work are based on performance. It's all about how good we do. How well we perform in a certain area. Well, it's no wonder then that this mentality sometimes gets brought over into the church, into the realm of religion. We are so used to things being based on performance that we sometimes think that's true of our spirituality. And so we come up with this checklist of do's and don'ts in our minds, right? And over time, we start to gain confidence in this checklist. We start trusting in all of those check marks accumulating. Because whether we realize it or not, we have come to believe that if there are enough check marks, if we work hard enough, then that will ultimately tip the scales and earn us a home in heaven. Sadly, that's what a lot of people think. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 and it says that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. This means that all of us have messed up in a big way. Man. 
and that we really deserve to be punished. The Bible also says that it is impossible to work good enough, hard enough, or long enough to merit salvation. We have a sin problem, but we're incapable of fixing the sin problem. If we're going to be saved, our only hope is Jesus Christ and His performance, not ours. But boy, don't we have a tendency to think performance? To think that I've got to do more? Why do you think the Bible says over and over that we're saved by grace? Grace is unmerited favor. It's undeserved blessing. Now, this is not to say that obedience is, is not necessary. Obedience is very necessary. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that we must do the will of the Father to enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 7, 21. And Hebrews 5, 9 adds that Jesus is the source of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. But we must understand that our obedience is a yearning, not an earning. We are calling out, not cashing in. Our salvation is not based on our performance. If it were, we'd all be hopeless. Salvation is by grace. And though we obey to the best of our ability, we should never trust in our own actions to merit salvation. Well, with that said, today I want to look at a parable in Luke 18 about a guy who put a lot of trust in his accomplishments. He clearly had this performance mentality. He thought that his own actions had merited justification before God. It's the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. It's actually the second parable told there in Luke 18. Both parables involve prayer. The first parable, the persistent widow, teaches us to pray persistently. To be fervent and not give up praying. The second parable talks about humility in prayer. This is the parable we're going to look at. It's Luke 18, beginning at verse 9. We read, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, I want you to look at this parable closely. And I want to focus in on the Pharisee, this guy who was performance-driven. The reason I want to focus on this performance-driven Pharisee is not so much because of the Pharisee in the temple. I'm worried about the Christian in the church who suffers with the same mentality. I fear that we might see us in him, all right? And so let's break this down. First, I want you to notice that Jesus had a target audience. He had a group in mind. Who was that group? Those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. What does it mean to trust in yourself? The idea is to rely on or to have confidence in. And I'm telling you, this is a bigger problem than we probably think. It's not just a problem with, with the church. It's a problem in general. If you were to walk down the street and start asking people, are you going to heaven when you die? Most people would say yes, wouldn't they? And if you ask them why they're going to go to heaven, their responses would all be the same. Are you going to heaven when you die? 
Yeah, I think so. Why? Well, because I'm a good person. I go to work and support my family. I don't run around on my wife. I go to church sometimes and put money in the plate. I think I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a, I'm a good person. Or if you go to a funeral, this never fails, does it? The guy doing the eulogy always says the same thing. We're going to miss so-and-so, but he's in a better place because he was just such a good person, right? And so, so this is a bigger problem, problem than we probably think. We don't even notice that we're trusting in ourselves, but we do. The correct answer would be, are you going to heaven when you die? Yes. Why? Because of what Jesus did. Amen. Because Jesus died for me and I put my trust in him. Right. right, but we don't even notice that we're trusting in ourselves, yet we do it all the time. We're relying on, we're putting confidence in us. And that's dangerous. Well, these people also treated others with contempt. The two kind of go hand in hand. The more highly you think of yourself, the less you think of others. These are two hallmarks of self-righteousness. We think too much of ourselves and too little of others. Well, that's who this parable was directed at. Those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. There are two main characters in the parable. A Pharisee and a tax collector. Now, these two were polar opposites. In Jewish society, you couldn't get further apart than Pharisee and tax collector. The Pharisees were a Jewish sect that developed during the intertestament period. That's the 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And at first, I think the Pharisees started with good intentions. Their name means separated ones. And in the beginning, they were trying to separate themselves from pagan influences on Hebrew culture. That's how the Pharisees came about. They didn't like these pagan influences. And so in opposition to that, they, they separated themselves. They became the separated ones. But over time... They started putting more emphasis on external deeds, human traditions, and before long, they had become very self-righteous. They thought highly of themselves. They trusted in their works while looking down on other people. Well, this guy was a Pharisee. The other guy was a tax collector. Tax collectors were outcasts in society. They were viewed as being traitors and extortioners. They were traitors because they worked for the occupying Roman Empire. They were doing Rome's bidding, and that turned the Jews off. They were extortioners because most tax collectors took more money than they were required to take. They did that to fatten their own pockets. And so I want you to picture the scene. It's very important. You have a very pious, well-respected Pharisee on one side, a low-life tax collector on the other side. To a Jewish audience, that would be noteworthy. Well, these two men, polar opposites, both walk into the temple to pray. There was a morning prayer in the temple at 9 a.m. There was an afternoon prayer at 3 p.m., we don't know if they were at one of these prayers or if this was just a casual occurrence. But these two men went into the temple to pray. And the Bible says the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus. Notice he was standing by himself. I don't know if there's any significance to that. There is no set posture for prayer. In the Bible, people prayed standing, sitting, laying down. Hanging on a cross, right? There is no set posture for prayer. But when it says he was standing by himself, I wonder if this wasn't Matthew 6, 5. Praying to be seen by others. This is what he prayed. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. 
extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. God, I thank you that I'm better than these other people. Isn't that what he's praying in essence? Boy, God, I sure do thank you. Praise your name that I'm better than these other people. I mentioned this checklist that we all fall prey to. This checklist of do's and don'ts. Well, if you notice in verse 11, he's thanking God for what he doesn't do. And then in verse 12, he thanks God for what he does do. There's that checklist, right? The do's and the don'ts. God, verse 11, I thank you that I don't do these things. That I'm not an extortioner. That I'm not unjust. That I'm not an adulterer. That I'm not like this stinking tax collector. These are the things I don't do, God, and I thank you for that. I find it interesting that this is a prayer of insults, not intercession. He's just insulting all these other people, isn't he? Well, after thanking God for what he doesn't do, in verse 12, he thanks God for what he does do. He says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. There was only one required fast under the old law, and that was surrounding the Day of Atonement. But over time, Jewish tradition started mandating more fasts. And by the first century, the Pharisees fasted twice a week, on Monday and Thursday. Now again, this is a big tendency for us today to start trusting in our traditions, right? To think that our our adherence to tradition is garnering favor with God. That's what the Pharisee was doing. God didn't say he had to fast twice a week, but he sure did it. And he thought it was a means of justification. He proudly prayed, God, I thank you that I fast twice a week. And I give tithes of all that I get. Even that was going above and beyond the requirement. But this smug Pharisee, Felt very good about himself, right? That's obvious. He was confident. He was a little arrogant. Contrast that with the tax collector. He was over in the corner. He was off by himself. The Bible says he was standing afar off. And he wouldn't even lift his eyes toward heaven. But he hit his breast saying, God... Be merciful to me, a sinner. Have you ever been that low? <coughs> to where you can't even lift up your eyes to heaven. You're just not worthy enough to do that. God, just be merciful to me, a sinner. Then Jesus gave these stunning words in conclusion. He said, you know what? It was that tax collector that went home justified. Not the Pharisee. What? To a Jew, this is unheard of. What? Yeah, Jesus said it wasn't a high-minded Pharisee. It wasn't that religious elite. No. It's the guy you despise. It's the guy you look down upon. It's the tax collector that went home justified. If this is not a lesson in self-righteousness, I don't know what it is. And yet it's so easy to fall prey to this. It's so easy to think very highly of ourselves while looking down on others. I want to make this contrast in their, in their attitudes and the way they prayed. It's a stunning contrast. The Pharisee was confident. The tax collector was uncomfortable. The Pharisee was haughty. The tax collector was humble. The, tax, or the Pharisee was merit-based. The tax collector was mercy-based. The Pharisee was contractual. The tax collector was confessional. The Pharisee was self-centered. The tax collector was sin-centered. The Pharisee was... Recognizing the unworthiness of others, the tax collector was recognizing the unworthiness 
of himself. Now, which one was God pleased with? Which fellow went home justified? Not the one we would think. Not the religious guy who was checking all the boxes. Not the religious guy who was dotting his I's and crossing his T's. Not the religious guy that everybody looked up to. It wasn't him. It was the tax collector. Boy, what a lesson that is. I told you, I'm not worried about the Pharisee in the temple. I'm worried about the Christian in the church. I'm worried that this could be us. Amen. That we make the same mistake. When you pray, do you thank God for how good you are? How good you're doing? God, I'm, I'm thankful that I'm in that church building every time the doors are open. I'm thankful that unlike some other people, I really do give sacrificially. God, God, I thank you that, that I pray every morning and before every meal and before going to bed. Thank you, God, that, that I'm so prayerful. Thank you, God, that I married a Christian. Got to be careful. Our focus must be on what Jesus does and not so much on our accomplishments. But this was, a, this was a big deal for the Pharisees. When you think Pharisee, you think self-righteous, right? You think performance-driven. There was a story a little earlier in the Gospel of Luke, in Luke 7, about the Pharisee Simon who invited Jesus over for dinner. And in those days, if you were having a prominent person over, like a rabbi, they weren't invited to the dinner, but neighbors could come and stand along the wall and at least overhear the conversation. And so that's what you have taking place in Luke 7. Jesus is invited to, to the Pharisee's house. He's a prominent person. And so the windows are open, the doors are open, and other people are allowed to come and just mingle along the, the sidelines. The problem is, one lady who walked in was a sinner. Her reputation preceded her. Most believe she was a prostitute. But whatever it was, everybody knew. And so she comes in, and before long, she's not standing along the wall. She's kneeling at the Lord's feet. She's sobbing and washing his feet with her hair and tears. She even opens up some expensive ointment and starts anointing the Lord's feet. Well, notice this Pharisee's response, Luke 7, verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner. Can't you just sense the condescension in those words? He didn't fold his arms in disgust, literally, but he did figuratively. He was taken aback. He was appalled. I cannot believe this man claims to be a prophet. He can't be a prophet. Letting a woman like that cling to him. Do you remember how Jesus responded, though? He didn't rebuke the woman. He rebuked the Pharisee. He started pointing out Simon's inconsistencies, Simon's shortcomings. Jesus was a master debater. He had a way of turning the tables, and he did that on Simon. Jesus said, in essence, you need to come off that soapbox. Get off your high horse. She's not as bad as you think, and you're not as good as you think. That's what the Lord said. And I think there are sometimes he'd say that to me, and he'd say that to you. That's the scary thing about self-righteousness. The one who has it's the last to know. I read about a guy who was a grandpa. He had his grandkids over one day, and he decides he's going to take a nap. And while grandpa's napping, they play a prank on him. They go out and they get some Limburger cheese. That is some rank cheese. And they put that on his mustache just below his nose. <laughs> and so when he wakes up, he grumbles, this room stinks. He walks into the kitchen, this room stinks too. He walks outside to get some fresh air, the whole world stinks. <laughs> and that's kind of how it is with a self-righteous person. <laughs> right? 
They can sniff out the sins in everybody else, but they can't sense it on themselves. Everybody else but them stinks. <laughs> That's the self-righteous person. It's hard to identify sometimes. One of the things that I really wanted to mention about self-righteousness, this goes back to the beginning about the fact that it's not performance-based, it's grace-based. If you're going to be saved, it's not because you're going to be able to stand before God and boast in your accomplishments. Our boasting will have to be in Jesus and His accomplishments. Amen. But one of the scary things about this mindset, this mentality, is that self-righteousness and grace cannot coexist. You can't have one with the other. And let me kind of walk you through this. Five areas, focus, fixation, foundation, filling, and fruit. Notice the contrast between self-righteousness and grace. Self-righteous people focus on what they're doing, right? Their work. Grace focuses on what's already been done, on the Lord's work. Amen. The self-righteous person is fixed on the outward, right? The external. All of these deeds that they feel are somehow meriting salvation, grace looks inwardly. Self-righteousness is founded in regulations, in rigid rule-keeping, right? In, in checking that box. Grace is founded on relationship. Self-righteous people are often frustrated people. Maybe you can relate. They're frustrated because the standard they set is too high for anybody to meet, including them. And, and so it's a life of frustration. They might put on a good front, right? But it's a life of frustration. Grace is a life of freedom. And then the fruit produced. Self-righteousness leads to one of two things. It'll either lead to pride or it'll lead to guilt. This is important. If you start trying to live up to all of these standards that you set for yourself, and you start holding yourself and everybody else to your standards, then you're either going to eventually swell up with pride because you think, I'm actually doing this, or you're going to crumble under the weight of pressure. The guilt will just be too great and you'll end up just giving up. Falling out. A lot of folks have done that, haven't they? Grace, on the other hand, produces love. We love him, the Bible says, because why? He first loved us. Amen. And so this might be the scariest part about self-righteousness. Self-righteousness and grace cannot coexist. They are opposites. They are antagonistic to one another. You can't live a self-righteous life and live a life of grace. You just can't do it. And as the Hebrews writer said, how sad would it be to miss out on the grace of God? That's what self-righteous people are doing. And again, a lot of times we don't even know we're doing it. Heard about a Bible class teacher. She had her kids in class and she's telling them about this bad Pharisee. How bad this guy was. He thanked God that he wasn't like a tax collector. She told her students, now bow your head while we pray. God, thank you that we're not like that Pharisee. See that? <laughs> See my point? We don't even realize we're doing it. Well, as we wrap up, I want to ask you to do a little self-evaluation. True or false? Look internally. Ask yourself, could I be guilty of self-righteousness? True or false? I'm quick to find fault in others. Is that true of you? True or false? I feel spiritually superior to others. True or false, I want people to see my good deeds. True or false, I don't like sinners and try to avoid them. True or false, I don't understand all the fuss about grace. True or false, I don't say sorry because I'm never wrong. True or false, I don't need help from anyone. Now, as you look at that and you kind of
compare that to your own life. Let's be honest. How many truth checks do we have? I think we all have a couple. In fact, if you say, I don't have any, then you're self-righteous. I'm just going to tell you. You failed the test. We're all going to have some. The question is, how many? And then the follow-up question to that is, how can I do better? Here's our problem. We like to compare ourselves to others, but it's always slanted. When's the last time you compared up? We don't do that, do we? We never compare up. We compare down. That's what the Pharisee was doing. He didn't say, God, boy, I think about the faith of Abraham. I think about the faith of David. I think about the great prophets of... No, I didn't do that. He wasn't comparing up. He was comparing down. God, I, I'm glad I'm not an extortioner. Glad I'm not an adulterer. We do the same thing. Right? Well, so-and-so, they average one Sunday missed a month. Glad I'm not like that. Right? I was with so-and-so. He and his wife, they, they fight like cats and dogs. Glad I'm not like that. We don't compare up, we compare down. And so the results are always tainted. I called this message the Pharisee in me because truthfully there is a Pharisee in me sometimes. I don't like him, but occasionally he'll rear his ugly head. I'll start thinking real highly of myself. And before long, I'm looking down on everybody else. I start to feel confident in me. I start to trust my achievements. And without even realizing it, I bought into this whole performance-based mentality. It's the way we are in life. Heard about a 12-year-old boy who went to his first orthodontist appointment. And he had one of those patient questionnaires to fill out. And so he's filling out this paper nervously, and he comes down to hobbies. It was one of the subtitles. And they asked him, what are your favorite hobbies? He put swimming and flossing. <laughs> Why? Because we all want to make ourselves look better than we are, right? We all want to put on our best front. That's true in life. And unfortunately, it creeps into the church. Around here, we say, take the mask off. Let's be honest with ourselves. It's the only way to be. Yeah, I've got some weaknesses. I've got some vulnerabilities. I do fall short. And just because I'm better off doesn't mean I'm better. Let me tell you what I mean by that. As a born-again Christian, washed in the blood, adopted into God's family, I'm better off. I'm better off than a lot of people around me. But just because I'm better off doesn't mean I'm better. Before God, we're all rank sinners. We all fall terribly short of His glory. And the only hope we've got is not us, it's Him. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we bow before you so thankful for another Lord's Day. Father, messages like this are difficult because we do tend to trust in ourselves. We take confidence in, in our own abilities, our own achievements. And the higher we get on ourselves, the more we look down on others. Help us to do better than that. Help us to be more like that tax collector. Help us to be honest with ourselves and to be honest with you. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the work he's done so that by your grace we can be forgiven and have that home in heaven. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're here and not a child of God, we never wrap up without giving you that opportunity. Come believing on the Lord with all of your heart. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be immersed in water to have all your past sins washed away. If you'll take those simple steps, you'll rise up cleansed by the blood and on the road that leads to heaven. Do you want to be a part of God's family? His door is open. He's ready to receive you. If you've never obeyed the gospel... Or if you have but you've sinned publicly and need our prayers, this invitation's for you. Come as together we stand and sing. Ooh.